All through history, as you read through Israel's history, the early church, whenever the people of God come into a place of blessing is when we are the most vulnerable to error, the most vulnerable to being self-centered, the most vulnerable to making foolish decisions and choices. And yet it's crazy because it's what the Lord wants for us to be a blessed people, to carry it well, but to remain servants. Um, I felt several years ago, I, I, felt like, I felt like the Lord just spoke to me that some of the secrets for city transformation are tucked away, hidden in the book of Proverbs, specifically hidden in the subject of wisdom. And in fact, uh, Brian Simmons has a tremendous translation of the Bible that he's working on, and individual books are released. I think we have the Psalms, uh, Luke, uh, the writings of Paul, and they're just brilliant, Song of Solomon. Um, but this is Proverbs that was just recently released. And just listen to this for a moment. It just really blesses me anyway. Uh, can you hear the voice of wisdom? From the tops of the mountains of influence, she speaks into the gateways of the glorious city. And there's just this beautiful, beautiful decree all throughout the subject of wisdom about excellence, about creativity, about integrity, and the impact that wisdom has on cities, entire people groups. It's vital that we think the way Jesus thinks. He rebuked three cities in Matthew 11, I believe it is. He rebukes three cities, Bethsaida, Chores, and Capernaum, and he rebukes them because they didn't repent. That's not the message I want to uh, enlarge on this morning. I just want to draw your attention to the fact he addresses cities. He addresses entire cities because his desires is his desire is for the salvation of entire people groups, entire groups of people in a community because communities have divine purpose that is not discovered in the individual. There is a representation of the kingdom that a community has that cannot be represented by just a local church, just by individuals who are strong in leadership or whatever it might be. So I've been on this quest for quite a few years. I love to read Proverbs. I love to go by the date, whatever date it is. I like to read Proverbs. This new translation has been very, very refreshing. From the tops of the mountains of influence to speak wisdom into the glorious city. And so I've just been, uh, in my own personal time, I've been calling Reading the glorious city because I feel like we just need to make decrees that, of what God is about to do. In this process, I've uh, also pondered the relationship between David and Solomon. So let me take a couple minutes to set this up. I've only got a one-point sermon. I just have about a 10-point introduction. <laughs> so just be patient with me. Once we get this ball rolling, it'll be a lot easier in the weeks to come, but I need to cover a little bit of territory here this morning. <clears throat> David's life is quite profound in scripture and is really my Old Testament hero. He's my favorite individual, mostly because of his heart for God, his value for the presence, his ability to live and function in the anointing, in the glory is, is quite profound. For a fact, his life and his ministry uh, as a king who led a worship ministry called the Tabernacle of David, that became the prophetic prototype of the New Testament church, verified in Amos 9, Acts 15, Entire another teaching for another day. We've, we, we've done before. But the point is, is David illustrates New Testament life because of his personal relationship with the Lord. But as it pertains to Solomon, I want to move the lines of New Testament example, and I want to move it to after David's life, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. In the scripture, David was used by the, by the Lord to get Israel ready for their inheritance. And Israel, when they left Egypt, they left Egypt, went through the wilderness, and they're coming into the promised land, and the Lord described to them, this territory, all of this is yours. Well, when Israel went in under Joshua's leadership, they never obtained all that, was, that belonged to them. And they didn't do it when Joshua went in. They didn't do it when the next generation. They didn't do it in the next generation. They lived short of God's design for a long period of time until David became king. When David became king, he started taking the territory that God said already belonged to Israel. 
And so here's this great military leader that went out with conquest, with great triumph, great victory. He was a man of war, and he took possession of all this land for the nation of Israel. All right. David had in his heart to build a temple. The tabernacle of David was a tent. It was, we have no description of it. We don't know what it was made out of. We don't know the size there. It's the only time that I know of in the Bible that I can think of offhand when there was a building involved that God didn't give description, definition of size, materials, etc. All we know about this tabernacle of David is that God was there and the worshiping community met with him and worshiped continuously 24 hours a day. That unusual piece of of uh, building material, if you will, that unusual building structure became the prototype of the New Testament church, which is interesting to me that God wouldn't give you a size because our size is always increasing. So the Lord uses this wonderful picture, and David now has it in his heart to build a temple, a permanent structure. And so he consults with the prophets. He meets with Nathan and Gad as counselors, and he says, hey, I've got it in my heart to build this temple for God. And, and the prophets go, oh yeah, God's with you. Just go for it, you know. And as soon as David leaves, the Lord speaks to him and says, no, David can't build it. And here's what I want you to hear. David can't build it. In uh, uh, 1 Chronicles 28.3, let me just read this one to you. It says, but God said to me, you shall not build a house for in my name, Excuse me. You shall not build a house for my name because you have, been a man, you have been a man of war and have shed blood. Let me read it again. You shall not build a house for my name because you have been a man of war and have shed blood. I, I used to think that that was the Lord's punishment on David because, because of his military style, his approach to conquering other nations. But when you stop to think about it, that doesn't seem right because God was the one who sent him into the wars. And God was the one who gave him the assignment. So if it's not punishment, which I've come to the conclusion it's not, if it's not punishment, then why would God not release the ability to build a temple to David? He says, because he's a man of war and a man of bloodshed. Here's where I'd like to draw the line. I believe that interestingly, Solomon's life in this context is the picture of New Testament life and ministry. All Old Testament ministry was, if I can call it this way, ministries of bloodshed. All Old Testament ministry is ministry of bloodshed. Why? Because the whole entire Old Testament was focused on the severity of sin. The prophetic pronouncements were always uh, death was pending. I mean, there was, there's just this ongoing dilemma of righteousness and reward and sin and eternal death and damnation. I don't want to do, we, we can't do away with that subject. It's the foundation for what God is doing now. But the important thing to see is that Old Testament ministry was the ministry of bloodshed. It was hurling prophetic words over the wall of the city, hoping the city inside would repent. New Testament ministry is different. Jesus described it this way. John the Baptist, who was the greatest of all Old Testament prophets, John the Baptist, Jesus described as singing the dirge, the mournful song. But Jesus described himself as the one who played the flute. In other words, the celebratory dancing, the rejoicing song. And so here's the two different kinds of ministry, Old and New Testament. One is addressing the problem. The other brings the solution. All of the Old Testament was to expose the severity of sin. The law and the prophets, that was the focus, is to address the severity of sin. In fact, interestingly, the law just constantly points to the severity of sin, the fact that there is no answer, and then finally, Jesus comes, and all the law and prophets point to Jesus as the only answer. Jesus cannot be one of many answers. If he's one of many answers, then the Heavenly Father was extremely cruel in requiring the death of his son to be one of the many answers. Something that severe could only be done because it would be the only answer for humankind, and that is we need a Savior. So Paul put it this way. He said, the law of the prophet says, the law is the tutor that leads me to Christ. So the whole Old Testament is this severe message. In the Old Testament, I love the Old Testament because everything's fatal. You know, you got a problem, you just kill the guy. That's really the only answer. Because, you know, people don't get saved, so it's just, the, you know, you got a rebellious kid, you take him out back, you just kind of deal with him. You know, that's just the only answer. And 
it's, 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 it's humorous, this side of the cross, you know, what, what they had to deal with. But if you picture this, if, if, you, were, if you were going to worship the Lord and, uh, and somebody uh, came to you that was an unclean person, maybe they had an issue of blood, perhaps they, they had some sort of sin thing going on in their life, if they touched you, you're now unclean. If you had a lamb that you were taking to be sacrificed at the temple and somebody came to you and spit on that lamb, even though that lamb is, was without blemish, it is now unclean. Because in, before Christ, everything that is wrong contaminates what's right. There's the contamination factor. Don't hang around an angry man. Why? Because you'll be angry. The whole point was evil contaminates its surroundings. Is that true today? It is still true, but there is a superior truth. Today we have something different, where in the Old Testament, if you touch a leper, you become unclean. In the New Testament, Jesus touched the leper, and the leper became clean. In the New Testament, the believing spouse sanctifies the entire household. So there is a shift in focus. Tragically, much ministry still to this day, 2,000 years after the death and resurrection of Christ, much ministry still is patterned after bloodshed ministries. And this is what I believe the Lord is saying. <sighs> Catch my breath. That's what I believe the Lord is saying, is that what he wants to build, he cannot build on bloodshed ministry. He has to build on the ministry of peace the ministry that brings answers, solutions to humanity. The difference between David and Solomon, I believe are very, very significant for New Testament life. I talk to you through the years often about the fact that throughout history, at least I've never been able to find where there was a great move of God, a great revival, and when it was passed on to the next generation, it actually increased in momentum. It always declines. We have the great heroes of faith who passed on their faith to their children, their grandchildren, and there was always decline. If we can call David's rule, his leadership, a revival, which in, in Old Testament uh, terms, it perfectly fits. This revival of David is the only time I can see where there was increase in the next generation. David passed it on to Solomon, and it actually increased in size, in momentum, in significance, and in the flavor of their leadership rules, it is as different as night and day, as different as Old and New Testament. Having said all of that, this is what we're looking for. I'm going to be taking a number of weeks for this. I believe that Solomon's life is the prototype of what God is wanting to do in the earth today. Consider this. Solomon has his encounter with the Lord. Well, we read it in a moment. In fact, you can turn to 1 Kings. That will probably help us to save a little bit of time. 1 Kings chapter 3. <clears throat> Solomon asks of the Lord wisdom, and we'll look at it in a moment. And when the Lord touches him with this supernatural gift of wisdom, we find kings, queens, Leaders of nations travel at great personal expense and great distances to come and sit at the feet of Solomon. The queen of Sheba made the statement that a servant in the presence of King Solomon has it better than a king over another nation. Well, that's, a, that's a stunning statement. A servant, somebody sitting at the feet of Solomon is better off than the other person who's ruling a nation. I believe that when the church is silent, the world has a voice. Let me put it this way. The world only has a voice where the church is silent. And the Lord is releasing a gift, a grace. First of all, it begins with a hunger, a hunger in you and me. Wisdom is not something that is just to be glibly requested as though it would be a nice addition to our life. In Scripture, it is actually held before us as something that has to be pursued with passion and at great personal expense. Solomon, when he deals with the subject of wisdom, he says wisdom is to be chosen above rubies. What is he saying? I believe he's saying this. You don't know that you're in pursuit of wisdom unless it costs you. 
There has to be the options where you have opportunity for immediate personal gratification, immediate personal gain, and you put that away because instead you prefer to have wisdom. Wisdom is the gift. It is, it is, the, it is the mind of the Lord. Wisdom is divine reasoning. Wisdom is that gift that makes us effective servants to humanity. There are crises and dilemmas, whether it's in your neighborhood, whether it's discipline in a local school, whether it's the economy of Reading or California, uh, international issues, a conflict in the Middle East, uh, uh, having to do with nature, the ozone layer, uh, the, you know, the global warming. It doesn't matter what it is, there are answers for every problem. God has not locked the planet into a destructive doomsday end. He has, he has put us on a planet that is under the weight of sin and he has put a people here who have access to the secret counsel of God to bring answers and solutions regardless of the problem that people are facing. That creative nature of wisdom is being released to those who will say, God, I want it more than anything. I want it more than anything. I remember as a kid hearing the story of Solomon. Again, I'm threatening you. We're going to read it. I remember as a kid, and I, I wasn't, you know, you gotta, you gotta put this into perspective, I was not the most spiritual child. I was the one my parents just hoped that would, would make it to heaven. That was their, their whole goal for me. So I, I did not walk around with deep conviction about things, I, except for baseball, you know, things of eternal significance like that. And, uh, but I remember, I could take you to the house where I lived at in Sacramento, 6600 Flamingo Way, on a corner lot. We lived in this house. I had a dartboard on the wall. A friend was there. We were playing darts, and I asked them questions. If you could have anything you wanted, what would you ask for? Because I just heard it in, in Sunday school or some, some Bible lesson somewhere. And I said, what would you have? And he said, in fact, I don't remember what he said. He, you know, probably a million dollars or something. And I said, well, I'd take wisdom. I felt stupid just in saying because I didn't know what I was talking about. I just figured it worked for Solomon. I'm going for it. I'm, I'm going for it just, just based on history. You know, this thing works, so that's what I'm going for. Eric just told me uh, after first service, he says the same thing he could remember on his 13th birthday, right? Blown out the candles for the birthday, uh, birthday cake, you know. And he just told me what he, re he could take it right to the place, the house that we lived in, everything. He could take it right to the place. And he remembers blowing out the candles for his 13th birthday, making a wish. And the wish was for wisdom. I believe these things get a hold of you where you become possessed with a purpose, possessed with a call. And I believe that this particular call for wisdom is going to be the key for the next phase of life for us as a church. We've got two elements that we have to hold in equal tension. It's power and it's wisdom. It's power and it's wisdom. And in light of those things, we, we can serve the world effectively. So I'm gonna to try to deal with these well in the, uh, in the weeks to come. All right, 1 Kings 3, are you still there? Or did you get tired and close? All right. Verse three, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in all the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense to high places. The king went to Gibeon, sacrificed there, for that was a great high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I shall give you. Solomon said, you've shown great mercy to your servant uh, David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. It's important to realize sometimes the reason you've been given a promotion is not because you earned it, but because somebody else created the momentum for you. It's just wisdom to realize you've been handed a treasure, and it's up to you to handle that treasure with great respect and value. Verse seven, now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I'm a little child, I don't know how to go out or come in. Your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart, that word understanding is hearing, to judge between people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? 
The speech, interesting, he called it a speech. The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon asked this thing. God said to him, because you've asked this thing and have not asked for long life for yourself, nor riches for yourself, nor the life of your enemies, but you've asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I've done according to your words. I've given you a wise and understanding heart. Verse 13, I've also given you what you've not asked for, riches and honor. There'll not be anyone like you among all the kings. Verse 14, if you walk in my ways and keep my statutes, as your father David walked, I will lengthen your days. Our final verse, verse 15. Then Solomon awoke, and indeed it had been a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, offered burnt offerings, made peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants. A long portion to read, but there's, there's no part that I want to miss. First thing to take note of is that this unusual encounter that Solomon had with God was in the form of a dream. Usually when you see something this significant, it's the appearance of the Lord. It's a theophany. It's where, where Jesus takes on flesh and appears to one of his own and begins to speak to him. But not this case. It's a dream. Sometimes you can make decisions in your sleep because you're possessed with an idea while you're awake. When you carry the realization of need and you carry the, the weightiness of a, of a God-given mandate, you can actually be trusted to make right decisions while you sleep. I don't know if you're getting this. God counted this as though it were a man-on-man -man conversation, and yet it was a dream. He appeared to him in his sleep. Solomon made the decision in his sleep. And God made a covenant with him there concerning the issue of wisdom. But there's one point that I need to bring up with you that is a warning. Solomon's life, as most of you will know, did not end well. I believe it's a prophetic prototype of New Testament life and how we're to impact the world around us. Not because we're know-it-alls, but because we're servants that just know where to get answers, know how to get answers, how to seek the Lord regarding things that people around us need, just believing that God will speak to us. Proverbs 25, verse 2 says, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search out a matter. God is glorified by hiding things, but he doesn't hide them from us. He hides them for us. They are to be found. They are to be discovered. It's the glory of kings to search out a matter. And the more you and I realize that God has given us royalty in our veins, which gives us legal access to the hidden things of God, the more we have access to those mysteries. It all has to do with the realization and discovery of divine purpose, that God has summoned me to seek the hidden things. In Matthew 13, it says, and it's God's good pleasure to give to us the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. The realm of mystery has been hidden, but now he has a generation of believers that have legal access to those mysteries. And it doesn't matter if it has to do with healing anointing and how to be more effective, how to hear the voice of the Lord better for the prophetic, or to heal something in nature, or to bring healing uh, in the conflict between nations. It doesn't matter what it is. God has answers for everything, and he simply awaits for the servants of the Lord to come before him and make request of the mysteries. But Solomon's life started with extraordinary blessing. So much so that David and Solomon's life was called the golden age of Israel's history. It's hard to imagine if you lived in David's time that it could get any better because they were so blessed, they were so protected, they were so safe because of the strength of David as a great leader. But it went up many, many, many times over when Solomon became king, so much so that the Bible says silver was piled up on the streets and was counted as nothing. 
They had become so prosperous and so blessed that it was difficult to measure the, the blessing. I heard something recently, in fact, I read something recently in a book. If you were to calculate the cost, I, th I think my numbers are accurate on this. It's at least fairly close. It's just ridiculous. If you were to calculate the cost of the Temple of Solomon that was built in today's number, if you would take uh, the cost of living increase over the last, I think, 100 years since they did this study, it would cost something like something crazy, like $500 billion. I mean, it's just the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard of. And yet this was building with cash expense with more left over for the king and the nation to live off of. What's the point? The point is, under Solomon's leadership, they came into a measure of blessing that was extraordinary. But here's the problem. It's in verse 3. 1 Kings 3, verse 3, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except he sacrificed and burned incense in high places. The Lord makes an unusual emphasis or uh, asterisk or a, a mark here by this, this experience, the fact that he offered on high places. He's not worshiping idols at this point. He's, there's not idolatrous worship. There's not the compromise in the sense of worshiping false gods. That didn't exist here. These are offerings that he's giving to the Most High God. The problem was is that the high place didn't have the presence. The high place represents self-will. It represents human reasoning. Solomon loved to give sacrifices to God, but as the Lord spoke or as Samuel, the Lord spoke through Samuel to King Saul, God values obedience above sacrifice. And here we have a king that is offering to the Lord offerings that God never requested, and God's not even attending the meeting. Here's the one point to the sermon. Finally. Worshiping on high places where God wasn't shows the possible failure and weakness that enters a life by being blessed. This kind of careless regard to what God says in his word is most often practiced by those whose lives are filled with luxury, the luxury of time, the luxury of privilege the luxury of favor, the luxury of resource, the luxury of friends. The more you become a blessed people, the more we become blessed of the Lord, the, more, the greater the possibility it is to read into the blessing that we can now do as we please with what God's given us. If this little desk could represent the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark was a wooden box overlaid with gold. There was um, uh, rings on the corners where poles would fit and they could be carried. There was two cherubim over the top. They faced each other. In the middle of these two cherubim is a chair, a seat, a place to rest. And it's where God's presence would literally rest. It was not symbolic. The seat was called the mercy seat. Inside were three items, the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments, uh, the um, jar of manna, uh, the continual testimony of God's supply and provision, and the almond rod of Aaron. It was a dead branch that came back to life and bore ripe almonds. These three items are inside the box. It's the record of God's history with, with people. He's the miracle answering God. He rests upon a seat of mercy, and all offerings were to be made before his presence, not through human reasoning at a high place that you think maybe is better and easier and closer to God. It's the same problem that we find with Mary and Martha in the New Testament. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. Martha was in the kitchen making sandwiches that Jesus never ordered. She wanted Mary to join her. It's human reasoning. It's worshiping through self-will instead of yieldedness to what God has said. 
And strangely, in this particular story, as you see Solomon giving these offerings and God appears to him in a dream, the first thing he does is, when he wakes up is he goes down back to Jerusalem to get before the presence because he instinctively became aware of something standing before this altar where God isn't, doesn't cut it. And he instantly went back to Jerusalem and began to give offerings to the Lord before the actual presence of God. What's the point? The point is, is the blessing is dangerous. All through history, as you read through Israel's history, the early church, whenever the people of God come into a place of blessing is when we are the most vulnerable to error, the most vulnerable to being self-centered, the most vulnerable to making foolish decisions and choices. And yet it's crazy because it's what the Lord wants for us to be a blessed people, to carry it well, but to remain servants. It's the Lord's heart. He fills the scripture with promises. And yet he constantly tries to lead us into a place of great breakthrough. But what happens is something gets built into the psyche of people where they build up a carelessness, a casualness with the things that are holy. Casual in the sense that there's not that sense of personal obligation to follow the specifics of what God says because now we have the power to make choices. In Weaverville, years ago, we would send teams of people out in ministry all over the world. We sent them to smuggle Bibles into China. We sent them to take in supplies in Romania behind the Iron Curtain. And I remember they would get this car that had secret compartments, and they'd put, get Bibles in the secret compartments, and they'd get it the, at the border, and the border guards would try to find things. They couldn't find anything because there's secret compartments. It's a magical car. And our teams of people would, would uh, take supplies in, medical supplies and things of that nature for the believers there in Romania. And we sent a number of teams over. Tracy was here first service, and she had gone four times herself besides the times that we sent complete teams. And they would come back. They'd come back with the stories that here under the Ceausescu or whatever his name was, the Romanian dictator, under his rule that was so anti-Christ in nature, the churches were filled to the rafters. I mean, any time there was a gathering, it was filled to the rafters. And the, the joy of, of people that had to pay a price to be there, the joy was extraordinary. Those who had been in prison, those who had suffered for the cause of Christ, those who had been beaten, those who had been threatened, those who had been, uh, you know, things taken from them uh, mil uh, financially, uh, monetarily. Um, and the joy that they had in worship and gathering after gathering after gathering. They didn't care if they got caught. So they would they'd go to the car and openly carry the Bibles out of the car. They just didn't care. They just had this, they had this relentless pursuit of God no matter what happened. We sent a team in a short time after the Iron Curtain fell. And our team came back with this most amazing report. The churches were no longer filled. The same zeal wasn't there. It was, it was like something happened where options got introduced into people's lives. They were given a power they had never had before, and that luxury deadened them to passion. I can show you in Scripture where persecution is not the will of God. There are some who say, well, that's just the, that's, that's just the way God works. No, he can use it, but he didn't design it. What he wants is a people to be blessed that remain servants, that learn how to take the gift of grace that's on us to help, to love. You know, you can threaten people into the kingdom. It does work. But it's supposed to be his kindness that leads to repentance. It's supposed to be the fact that you and I love people. It's the fact that we care for people, that we serve them, that somehow people are one because a company of people have come to them with compassion, affection, and a willingness to remain servants, bring solutions. I believe that Solomon, Solomon's choice for wisdom is to introduce us to a role shift that has been happening for years, but I feel like if we can talk about it for a few weeks, it'll be like adding steroids <laughs> to the subject. I feel like the Lord is going to put a turbo booster on this subject 
where we become more intentional in our personal hunger, cry, our pursuit of wisdom, and our willingness to ask God for answers for dilemmas, problems, crises that are being faced around us. Solomon did it right for a season. And then he messed up bad. I believe it's possible for you to bring the most unusual witness to this world that they've ever seen. In Hosea 3 verse 5 it says, the people will fear God because of his goodness. We've seen the church grow in persecution. We've seen natural crisis. We've seen war. We've seen all kinds of conflicts that have caused the purity of the heart of people to, be, to become strong and stable and press into the things of God. I don't know if history has ever seen a people that prospered, were blessed, and were highly favored as a company of people that maintained the same sense of absolute devotion and purity. But I believe that before this thing's over, there will be a witness to the nations, and it will be undeniable. It's the witness of the goodness of God. According to Psalm 67, it's a witness that is given through the people of God living in the blessing of the Lord. I don't mean that we become rich cats building our, you know, our personal empires. I, 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 I'm not buying into that. But I am saying there is a measure of blessing that the Lord would release to every individual that is extraordinary and will capture the attention of great groups of people because they'll look at what's on your life and they'll look at you and say, they're good, but they're not that good. That must have come from God. And I feel like there honestly is something about to be released over a group of people that learn to live with the devotion and the focus of an end times people that are not looking to be rescued, but instead are looking to rescue. That will change the course of history. Why don't you stand and let's pray. But this is... This is what is needed outside of here. While the cancer, of course, being healed is needed, all those things that are obvious. Sometimes what people need is just to know how to reconcile as a husband and wife because they're, they're separated and they don't know how to make things work. They don't have the tools. Sometimes it's they've, they've got a kid that, that is just so unusual. They don't know how to deal with him. They reject him. They scorn him. They punish him. And, and they don't realize that that kid is uniquely gifted and they don't have the tools. Sometimes they just don't know how to make their business work. They've got a good idea, they've got good location, good favor, the resources, but they just don't know how to make it work. And they just, they need the gift that's on some of you that just stands in there and just becomes a servant and says, you know, if you try this, you need to try this. We got people all around us that need something that you have and it's called the kingdom of God. But here's the biggest challenge. I will expand this in weeks to come. It's easy to choose the principles over the presence. It's easy to use the patterns of offering to God instead of the actual giving of a life in service to the Lord. This is what keeps this pure. This is what keeps this on track. It's not my intense devotion. It's not all my disciplines and all these other things that have value. It is the presence. It's the glory of God working in the heart of an individual that keeps us in a place of being truly, completely, regularly effective. So I pray for this right now on, on this company of people. I pray in the wonderful and mighty name of Jesus that a grace for wisdom, and even more than wisdom today, I pray that a hunger for wisdom would so possess our soul that we find ourselves in pursuit at a way we've never recognized before. I pray this, that the name of Jesus would be exalted over all the earth by every nation. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen.